Okay. Um, I hope all of you can see and hear. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties here. Um, we weren't able to open it up because there's still so much light. It's the, it is summer solstice. I'm Aaron Paley, and I'm with Community Arts Resources, and we're part of the design team. I'm really happy to welcome you here tonight. Uh, it's a very exciting day for us. On behalf of all of us on the design team, Rios Clemente Hale Studios and um, Brenda Levin Architects, the three firms are working together to bring this, and I am proud to present, uh, to introduce Martha Wellborn of Grand Avenue uh, Committee, who is going to uh, actually reintroduce the team, right? Sorry. I'm actually going to introduce Bill Whitty. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Uh, it's Aaron's handiwork that has created this event, so I, we really can't thank him enough. I just wanted to welcome everyone. Yeah. This, I, I think I'd like to welcome everyone to the, the first event in the park under this new uh, effort to create a, a, an even better park than what exists here right now. And I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of both the Joint Powers Authority, the Los Angeles Grand Avenue Authority, and the Grand Avenue Committee, both of which I represent. We had some JPA board members here a while ago, and others may show up. I don't know, but if they do, we'll, we'll bring them uh, right up here. But tonight, we're really here focused on the park itself, not on the building project, which we met with many of you on, hopefully, about a month ago. This is, this is a focus just on the park. It says workshop number one, but as many of you know, last year we also had a lot of workshops. It's just that it, at this point, with the approval of the master plan, we're now into a, a new phase of the design of the park. And this is the phase that will result in the actual park that will that will be built. We now have a budget. We have a lot more under our belts and known than we knew about a year ago. So with that, what I would really like to do is turn it over to Bill Whitty, who is the president of the Relating Companies in Southern California, and he will introduce the the uh, Civic Park Design Team. Bill. Thank, thank you, Martha. Um, this is the first of what will be three public hearings on the Civic Park. And as I think you can see from the boards around you, uh, Aaron and the team, I think, did a really great job. Um, this is specifically, um, the objective tonight is specifically to hear from the public and get ideas about the use of the park, um, following some presentation from the design team about the history of it, kind of what, what we have here today. So we were charged uh, by the Joint Powers Authority with overseeing the process to design and implement uh, improvements to the Civic Park. And so we did the smart thing. We went and found the best people uh, we could find in the city to really run this effort. Um, you met Aaron. Um, you'll soon hear from Brenda Levin, principal of uh, Levin Associates Architects, and from Mark Rios, a partner in Rios Clemente Hale, who I think are, are an exceptional team covering architecture, urban design, landscape ac architecture, and programming of the park. They're going to walk you through um, some of the, our thoughts, background, and concepts, and we'll uh, take it from there. So with that, let me turn it over to Brenda Levin. Thank you, Bill. Um, maybe we should start by just orienting you a little bit on uh, the Civic Park, the location of the Civic Park, and its relationship to Block Q, which is the first phase of the development that is underway uh, in design with uh, Frank Gehry's office. So the Civic Park uh, that we're sitting in, we're sitting in this site right now, and uh, what we refer to as Block Q. These two sites are tied together in that the terms of the JPA um, dictate that they are open concurrently, both the park and uh, Block Q. So what was the design team asked to do? We developed a scope of work uh, based on uh, conversations with Grand Avenue Committee and the related company. Uh, focused on research and documentation, uh, community outreach, and the final product being a pre-schematic design for the park. 
So we are right here in our community workshop programming phase. We're about halfway through our process. We started in April and we are going to complete the schematic design in September. And you've heard that there will be three workshops. The second one is August 19th, and it will be held at, it's a Saturday, by the way, and it will be held at the National Center for the Preservation of Democracy in Little Tokyo, and you will all hear more about that uh, in the future. Um, we obviously wanted to build on all the good work that's been done to date, and uh, so we began our process in looking at the previous design proposals. We assembled all the studies all the way back to the 1909 City Beautiful uh, proposal through the grand intervention that the uh, Lear Center led in 2005. Um, so starting back backwards, the 2006 uh, park workshop that we're at right now is the first street plan, the SOM master plan, the Grand Avenue realignment, uh, 2003 reimagining Grand Avenue, which led to the formation of the JPA and the development project. Um, some of you remember the downtown strategic plan in 89, um, the 10-minute uh, uh, diamond, uh, McGuire Partners uh, development team for Bunker Hill. Uh, there was a Luckman plan in 59. In 66, the Sivert Center Mall was completed. And then working back, of course, the Olmsted plan, Olmsted Bartholomew plan, which really focused on parks in Los Angeles. And of course, we would have been in great steed if uh, that plan had been implemented. Uh, the Bunker Hill redevelopment. Uh, and back, as I said, to the Robinson plan of City Beautiful, finally to the initial plan for the city, the 1849 Ord plan. Uh, we are also building on the work that's been done before, which is the SOM uh, design concept plan, which was for both the development sites, all of the blocks of the development sites, as well as the city park, uh, the civic park. And we tried to summarize the uh, great work of uh, the Lear Center with the Grant Intervention Project. You see the boards out there. This is really a uh, uh, sampling of the many projects that they received. And the, uh, what we tried to do is sort of summarize the major categories for these projects, and they fell into create large-scale gathering places, uh, restaurants, um, places for art, places for quiet reflection, urban gardens. Um, so what we do and what you can see on the board is a summary of the major themes and then the number of submittals that included those themes. We also gathered examples of case studies of urban parks and civic plazas from around the world. Um, to help develop a criteria for creating a public space for a diverse population. And so we looked at uh, first, you know, local, not locally, but nationally, um, some parks that have some similarities to them to our park. Um, and we'll go through each one individually. Um, Rockefeller Center, part of the similarities to Rockefeller Center are, is that it is bounded by buildings similar to the first, to, to the Civic uh, Park. It also has some activity generators in the, uh, we all know the ice rink, and some water features in the middle, um, some quiet areas, and some active areas. Pioneer Square, Courthouse Square in Portland, um, is a park in the center of town. It's uh, multi-levels. It uses the steps to both transition grade, but also to create activities. It also has a major water feature. It has a bookstore and a Starbucks to activate the space. And there are uh, uh, cultural facilities around the park. Uh, Bryant Park in New York City, which is bad bounded by the New York Public Library, has a beautiful great lawn, which is used for both passive uh, use as well as programmed functions. It also has a series of valets along the side. And one of the things that's very interesting about Bryant Park is that all the seating is flexible, movable. You can reconfigure uh, the park seating area uh, on a daily basis. There are also some kiosks and vendors and food and actually a bar. 
Um, Yerba Buena in San Francisco is a park. What's interesting and related to ours is that it's divided by a street. Uh, there is a bridge, pedestrian bridge, between the two areas of the park. One large green space, smaller, more active in, uh, spaces. And again, surrounded by cultural institutions, uh, not unlike Grand Avenue for us. And finally, Millennium Park in uh, Chicago. It's probably our most recent example of a new urban park with a great lawn, also a pedestrian bridge over main circulation, vehicular circulation, um, both passive and active recreation, uh, cultural facilities, softscape and hardscape, and uh, obviously alleys of trees a major water feature, and of course the art pieces that are really significant in uh, Millennium Park. We've also looked at parks internationally around the world, looked at civic plazas, looked at uh, basically prototypes of the use of parks in culturally diverse populations. One of the things that's been fascinating about our work to date has been to review the history of the site and its evolution over time. And so we really looked back at uh, from 1900 all the way to present day how the site has evolved. And we'll go through each one. 1906, uh, you see the dotted outline, is the um, uh, Civic Park. Oops, can you go back, Alice? Sorry. Um, you see the Court Street runs right up the middle of it. You see that Spring Street had a kink in it, and that there was another street that only exists on the other side of the freeway, New High Street. 1930, um, you see the courthouse, the new uh, Hall of Records, and Court Street still in place, but also the introduction of uh, City Hall. So you begin to see the reference to City Beautiful and the east-west axis that is still retained today. And then, of course, in the uh, 60s, uh, Bunker Hill development started. We started to raise the hill, and we lost the fine texture of the site, and we were really introduced to super blocks. Uh, the uh, Hall of Records was still there until the Hall of Administration was in place, uh, but the courthouse is down. Um, the state office building uh, was here until about the 80s, the law library, uh, the county court as we know it, and the Hall of Administration, and of course, the development of the Music Center. And then finally in 2006, what we see today, and those of you who took the tour, um, much Alice, can we go forward? <laughs> Thanks. Um, much of, oops, uh, much has uh, remained the same with the exception of a on-grade parking lot that's been developed adjacent to City Hall. And this is one of our opportunities to actually plant in grade. It's the only space in the, in the Civic Park that is not on top of structure. And we thought it would be interesting for you at least to see a composite of the development of downtown and particularly this area and how it has evolved and changed over the years and sort of the scale difference uh, of the city uh, fabric. We also wanted to look at open space in the adjacent area to the downtown uh, uh, region. Um, so we looked at the existing conditions and uh, open space. This circle reflects a 10-minute uh, walking circle um, and uh, you see the major freeways and the neighborhoods surrounding downtown and the parks uh, noted. Uh, as you come in a little bit closer and you begin to see really what the frame of reference is in terms of neighborhoods, uh, Central City, uh, uh, Chinatown, uh, Little Tokyo, the Arts District, the Financial District, the Convention Center, all sort of in this region. And, and that really there are very few parks uh, relate in this area with the exception of getting over to Vista Hermosa. So we'll look at that in a second. This represents about uh, six-tenths of a mile, five to six blocks, about 1.2 miles uh, in the circle. Uh, and we did look at local resources because we're trying to make sure that we provide a park that has resources that aren't elsewhere in the region. So we've identified which parks have active recreation, which ones are for more passive, which ones have performance venues, and you can see some pictures of the parks um, noted in the region. 
Uh, we also wanted to look at wa ways to connect to the community. One of this, uh, the issues with this park is that it's very internally focused, um, but we really do want to try to find ways to connect to Little Tokyo and Janum and the um, National Center for the Preservation of Democracy, where the next workshop is going to be. There are some districts, there are landmarks, there are cultural institutions that surround this and that are actually being developed, including the new um, Performing Arts High School. We also see there's some view corridors that uh, connections from the center of the park, trying to make these connections back along Olive to Disney Hall to Block Q obviously preserving these major view corridors to the Music Center and to City Hall. Um, so what existing conditions are we dealing with? Well, we have the park that runs uh, between uh, the Grand Avenue and Spring Street, interrupted by Hill and Broadway. We have the Music Center, the Department of Water and Power, uh, the major uh, um, Fountain, a central plaza where the Starbucks is, the Court of Flags where we're in right at the moment, probably has never seen this much, much activity <laughs> before today, uh, and the surface parking lot. Uh, what are the barriers to access? Well, in addition to the fact that the park is completely surrounded with the exception of this um, southeast corner um, by buildings, so it is internal. Um, the park also has some barriers in the upper ramps at Grand Avenue and at Hill Street, and of course the vertical separation here at the Court of Flags. Uh, the topography is such that um, it is 70 feet between Grand Avenue right here and uh, Spring Street and these are the steps going up to uh, City Hall. There are two distinct grade changes, one at Grand Avenue, which is about 18 feet, and the other here at the Court of Flags, which is about 15 feet. And so while it's uh, gentle as you look at it on a, a site section, when you walk it, it's not quite the same. So again, we have opportunities and constraints. Our constraints are uh, perhaps these ramps and the grade changes that we've identified. Um, we have some opportunities. We have this fountain. We have some monuments in the park. All of these red dots are various monuments that are documented. There are wonderful views from the top of Grand to City Hall and from right here as you turn around and look at uh, City Hall, some fabulous views. We have the Metro Rail portal here. Uh, which is a wonderful asset, and um, we have some blank walls basically to the Hall of Records and the Law Library, which might provide some interesting opportunities as we begin to talk about programming. We have an initial budget for this project of about $50 million, $51 million. The bulk of that money is coming from uh, the agreement in the JPA for the uh, basic land lease of Block Q. That money, $50 million, is going into the park. Um, the budget sort of divides somewhat uh, this way, which can be, which really is our first take and understanding of uh, what the issues are, less than a design strategy or a scenario of how the dollars will be spent. But there is infrastructure and modifications, including the ramps um, and uh, utilities and uh, public restrooms. There are new amenities that we'd like to think about. Um, site work that needs to be done in terms of landscape and hardscape, repair and maintenance issues, and um, a streetscape as part of this budget. So as Martha mentioned, we've been doing community re outreach for actually a fairly long time. This is the first workshop of this design team, but the related company and the Grand Avenue Committee have been doing community outreach. And uh, they held five uh, workshops in downtown South LA, East Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley, and uh, the West Side. And we had a lot of feedback and interest in the park. And there are some themes, again, that emerge that are really not that different from the Lear Center themes, nor some of the opportunities that we've offered to you today in terms of make it truly urban, be bold, uh, reflect the diversity of Los Angeles, make it green, uh, let's see, uh, don't make it fake, appeal to families, 
uh, incorporate high quality design. And probably most importantly, I think what people are looking for is a 24-7 environment. So that's our research. I'd like to turn it over to Mark Rios now. We'll walk you through some of our design strategies and take you up to um, our workshop that will follow. Thank you, Brenda. Um, it's an exciting time for a design team to be here tonight to um, share with you our research to date and some initial ideas we've been generating. And the majority of this evening is going to be spent with you sitting around tables in the shade over there, um, trying to sort of go through the same process we've been going through, thinking about program and trying to understand where the program might fit on various parts. Um, tonight's goal really deals with ideas of what you want to do in the park, what are the most important things you want to do in the park, and where those things might start allocating spatially. I think we have another two workshops to be talking about specific design solutions. Tonight we really want to focus on what the program might be. Next slide. Um, we keep talking about this project as remaking a public space. We already have a public space here. I think we'd all say that it has some things about it that work and a lot of things that maybe don't work. Um, we're really looking at how we take and remake, recreate this into a very active, successful public space. As a team, we've identified four goals for the project. One is to make it distinct, make it a unique destination point for everyone in Los Angeles. Number two, make it connect, connect in lots of ways. Connect for pedestrians, connect from mass transit, connect through automobiles, connect visually. How do we really create um, access to the project for lots of um, different modes of interaction. Number three, how do we make it active? I think all of us know that if you make a big open space, there's no guarantee that anybody's going to ever use it. The only way you make an open space accessible is through very clear programming, um, really understanding the various possibilities, the requirements, the constraints for program. How do we design those into the place and making it active is essential. And number four, how do we make it a place for all of us? And so really looking at this incredible diversity that we have, how do we incorporate as much of the ideology and culture and history of this place into opportunities that might inspire um, the park? So with that, um, many of these things are ideas that we've talked about um, through um, the prior workshops, there are ideas that we're discussing tonight about its identity, its sustainability, really trying to find ways of taking the topography and turning it into an advantage as opposed to a sort of a separation, um, looking at LA as a source of ideology, how that might sort of percolate through into ideas for the park, and um, overall, how do we make this a really beautiful, wonderful experience for all of us? Um, connections. Um, I think probably the connective aspect of the park is its biggest problem today. Um, nobody knows it's here. How do we make it more visible? Um, how do we make it more part of the routine, the paths for everyone here? And how do we sort of make it more visible for people that can use this from outside the area coming to this um, park? So it's a connection to transit, to views, to the streets that bisect the park are essential. Um, number three is, again, making it active. Um, looking at the variety of experiences and, and programs that might um, be able to be um, undertaken here and really understand what are all those requirements. How do we service them? How do we do all the infrastructure? How do you make them um, easy to operate? Because um, that will really determine the success of it. And finally, um, trying to make the park appeal to a diversity of Angelinos, um, both as far as age, culture, lifestyle. Um, how do we bring scale to this place? I know the scale is very, very large. We want to bring down the scale. Um, how do we make it safe? Um, how do we make it be easily maintained so that it can perpetuate itself in a very positive way? Um, we've asked you to help identify what your um, priorities are as far as programs and goals. It's really fun to go over and look at the board now and see all these green dots everywhere. Um, lots of green dots on shade and garden and sort of quiet meditative places. They're actually, we're surprising a huge number of dots on overstreet pedestrian crossings. So it sounds like everybody wants to have some bridges here. But if you haven't sort of gone and sort of weighed in on the kinds of activities um, you think um, would be great for the park, please do that before you leave tonight. 
Um, that's really our main focus. I think a lot of these activities are not exclusive of one another. Although we've asked you to sort of prioritize them, a lot of the activities can actually happen in the same places. But we want to know sort of what the ranges are. Um, we sort of um, base them in <clears throat> a few large categories. The first category are large gatherings. And I think this is um, very, very special for this particular location because this park should be really the park for the city. Um, it's really in the heart of the city. It has our prime um, government and institutional um, um, residents surrounding it. And so how to make this a place for special events and gatherings, ceremonies, how we make it operate both in the day and night um, is very, very important to us. And how we provide all the infrastructure so those kinds of things can happen is really essential to making successful large sort of event and gathering spaces. Um, number two, um, we really believe that unless we provide food here, it's not going to be successful. And so the incorporations of cafes and restaurants, um, some kinds of markets are really essential. There are quite a few parks that we can point to that had intended to have food vendors or restaurants. They never opened up for a whole variety of servants and health department reasons, and they've proved to be very problematic. And so we're really trying to um, look at all those issues and really solve them so we can make sure that we can incorporate restaurants, cafes, farmers markets, um, the kinds of things that make places that people really want to be in. Number three, um, in addition to sort of these big gathering places, we want to make sure that we have smaller places for activities. And I think what's really important about this is that things have to happen in a park simultaneously. If there's only one event in the park, you go to that event and it may be fine, but what's um, um, more productive is if more than one thing is happening at a time and you can sort of go and see a variety of things in the park and that if we can really find a way that something can always be happening in the park. And so smaller activities are probably the way to make that happen. Large activities might happen once a week, once a month, you know. It's the smaller activities that really need to be thought out and planned and programmed. Um, Individual spaces are essential. Um, there needs to be places in the park that have a smaller scale, um, that provide amenities for all of us to come at lunchtime or on weekends and enjoy the um, opportunities here. And I think one of the things that's um, very important that we design quiet spaces. We need to design spaces that fulfill large gathering requirements. We also want to pr um, provide smaller, intimate um, retreat kinds of spaces. Unexpected surprise. How do you do that? How do you design something that's unexpected? I'm not quite sure, but I think it's actually about providing opportunities for things to happen. And so we're trying to sort of look at what are the things that bring people to parks and what intrigues them and what surprises them. Um, urban gardens are, are an essential thing that we've um, heard a lot of people talk about. Um, and so whether the gardens are about sustainable issues, they're about ecological issues, they're educational, all those things are, are important to the design of this. Um, and trying to find a way that those gardens can actually start and inform circulation systems and activity places for the park. Um, water features. Um, had everybody spent, had seen the fountain up here before tonight? Yes, everybody's seen the fountain? One, a few of you haven't. The fountain is like one of the hidden gems at least that's some of our opinions. We'll see what your opinions are tonight. Um, water is essential for drawing people, having activity. Um, it's a dynamic resource. And so we're looking at different ways that water can be used, both in sort of active manners and in quiet, more passive manners. Um, art and play. Um, art is essential for conveying storytelling, um, who we are and what our values are as a culture and society. And so the incorporation of artists in our design process be um, essential, and a few images of some fantastic things. How art can actually make these fantastic parts to our park are essential. And um, play, um, sometimes play happens in structured ways and also in unstructured ways. I think we all hope that there can be um, unstructured play activities in this park. Um, we've um, spent some time looking at some overall design strategies. and. We thought it might be helpful to go through those with you, and um, they're really um, the key fundamental steps that we're starting to look at as far as how you organize and design um, this particular place. So um, let's go through those. Um, the first and perhaps the most important on design strategy is how do we provide access to the park? And access, again, as Brenda's talked about, deals with sort of the ramps at Grand, the ramps here. 
great changes to the Court of Flags. There's another ramp down by City Hall. Um, how we make those connections happen in a much more powerful way. Number two, how do we accommodate some of the new urban movement patterns? Um, since this particular site was developed, um, there are a lot of new facilities that we have, um, the new um, police station, sort of the public plaza outside the city hall, um, the cathedral, Disney concert hall, um, various new um, buildings are starting to happen in the civic center area which change the way people move. And we think that this new park should be able to reinforce and work with those new movement patterns. Number three, how do we acknowledge the streets that Spring Street and Broadway that actually tend to bisect the park. How do we actually take the park and pull it out to First Street and pull it out to Temple? So the park actually feels like it's this big as opposed to just this big. And so these streets are essential, I think, in the acknowledgement and entrance sequence of how you get to this place. Number four, how do we start and locate program appropriately? When you start thinking about all the various um, parameters of the existing buildings, um, how the subway station is located, where the bus routes are, um, program starts and allocating itself in different kinds of ways. This part of the site probably um, may end up having more highly programmed places to it just because of issues of accessibility. This part of the site may have um, more past program pieces based on the courthouse, the Hall of Administration, and so we're trying to look at how the site, in a sense, designs itself based on all these the contextual issues. Number four, I think the thing we've heard maybe the most in talking to lots and lots of people, they really want to have this green space slicing through the city. And we keep thinking of this as this gigantic green carpet that sort of extends from the music center all the way down to City Hall. And you know, there may be places you, you cross through it, you move through it, places you can occupy for performances, but its overall character really feels as though it's this huge green landscape thing passing through the city. Number six, um, there are all sorts of shortcuts that we'd like to be able to take through this. And if we really acknowledge those shortcuts, people will actually use the park more. And for example, um, the metro is sort of a location that people are sort of entering this place. How do you get from there down to there? Or for example, here's the entry to the cathedral. Right now we're sort of walking down Temple and sort of, you know, um, across the street here, Hill Street. If there are other ways of sort of making these sort of connections and diagonal links, it'll make the park tie more into the um, urban fabric. Number seven. Um, we, we think it's very important to acknowledge the history of this particular place. Um, we think we can do a new park that solves all these sort of aspirations that we collectively have, but can acknowledge um, the existence of prior street patterns, some of the sort of original um, city development um, blocks of the, of the courthouse and hall of administrations, um, the idea of the, of the large scale space um, by the city be be beautiful movement connecting the city hall with the music center. Um, we want to find a way to have the memory of those various parts of our urban life captured in the new park design. Number eight, um, I love this word, indulge the spectac spectacular. Um, this is Tony's word in my office um, of trying to find a way to really make some fantastic things happen here. Um, we want the park to sort of work in local ways, to work in quiet ways. We want to have the park be this really unique, special thing that everybody wants to bring their friend or their family to see what's happening. And so it may end up being the fountain, it may end up being movement patterns, it may end up being a, um, a bridge across the street, it may end up being a band shell. But how do we have those spectacular things happen? And finally, how do we anticipate for the future? Um, we're all thinking that this park, in a way, our first phase is laying the groundwork for a park that's going to continue to evolve. Um, the $50 million budget that Brenda talked about is a lot of money. Um, a lot of that money is going to be spent on infrastructure here, dealing with the ramps, dealing with the grading. Um, it will go very, very fast. And so we're trying to find a way the park can have extended lives and um, extended designs. One of the um, things we're looking at, for example, is there's been some conversations dealing with uh, um, the courthouse and the hall of administrations. If those facilities might be located, at, relocated at some point in time, how do they change the park? How do we build something that can have um, transformation in the future if other land is available? And so that's part of our charge collectively to be really looking at this um, now, but also trying to sort of plan for the future. 
And so tonight we're going to ask for all of you to participate and get involved in this. Um, we put together this toolkit and um, we're going to reconvene after some questions here to tables. And um, we have this set of parts. And each one of the parts has sort of a name on it that deal with um, spaces and activities. We're going to ask you to give some input on how you think the park might be organized, what program parts might be on it. And there are two things that you'll um, be using to do this. And Brenda, can you help me put this up? Right. At each one of the tables, we're going to have this sort of base plan that um, shows the park location. Um, and sort of a plan of the existing park on it. And on this side, this sort of this is your instructions of sort of how to go about this process. And I think that at first it may seem a little daunting, but I have a feeling everyone's going to really get into it tonight. And um, if we can look at the next image, there is a couple steps to this process which I think will be really helpful. The first step we're suggesting to think about the renovation aspects that um, some of the really big items um, for the park that we're struggling with do with the ramps, the fountain, the lawn, sort of the plaza. And so the first thing to be really thinking about are what are the big moves? And um, how would you prioritize those big moves? Um, the second um, sort of way to proceed with this process is to be thinking about the various spaces and zones, the gardens, plazas, lawns, sort of how you um, would enter, the, enter those spaces and you'll find in this kit of part all these pieces you can actually start laying on the um, ground plane to define those places um, within the park. The third um, course of action is to think about what features and activities go in those places. So once you sort of looked at, okay, we might have a lawn here, what are all the events that might happen, the program pieces in those kinds of spaces? And finally, um, the fourth sort of part of the process to look at sort of movement patterns, walkways, bridges, paths, and how they sort of link things together. In the abstract, this sounds a little complicated, but believe it or not, we've been through this process before. It's a little messy, but um, it can actually be a lot of fun. Um, here's some. Here's another workshop with these same kinds of pieces, and everybody actually gets into it and really starts lobbying for what they want, and we want to see you sort of go through the same struggle that we've been going through. So, um, and what our plan of attack here is tonight, in just a couple minutes, we're going to reconvene at the tables. We're going to probably have about 45 minutes to sort of do these experiments here and sort of get your input on it. Um, we're going to ask everybody to sort of tape these things down on the board, and then and at the end of the 45 minutes, we're all going to get up and sort of move around and look at from table to table at everybody's um, work tonight. Um, we're going to use this as a very valuable tool during the course of our design process. And so at our next design charrette um, in about seven weeks or so, you're going to see um, the results of all of your work synthesized into three different design schemes. And so this is a really um, sort of valuable contribution. We've gone through it. We need you to go through it also. And we want to sort of look at what are the similarities and differences, what things come to the surface. I think we're really trying to um, have a very process that um, respects all of our sort of collective ideas. So. So I think before we all get up and um, so what we're going to do now is uh, enter into a question and answer period. Let's thank uh, Brenda and Mark for that great presentation. Um, I see lots of questions, hands up, and what I'm going to ask you to do is use the mic, which is over here in the back, so that because uh, we are actually being webcammed. And people can hear you and, and see you. Uh, and we are sharing this with net viewers all over America and the world right now, uh, courtesy of the Lear Center. Uh, so first question, why don't you let a couple of you line up there. So you first, I hear. Wait, wait, hold on one second. He's going to get you live. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mario, and someone was nice enough to email me the invitation for tonight's event, and I was wondering how people in communities who don't have email access, who aren't reading the LA Times, are being brought into this dialogue. So that's my question. Well, I don't know if Lee Andrews is here or our outreach group, but we placed ads in 
I think, eight community papers. We translated into Korean and Spanish and Japanese and Chinese as well. Uh, so that was one thing. We were, we were on the radio in advance of this, and all I can say is that people had, and that we also did flyer distribution all downtown. Uh, there were also emails that went out to, for, to the, all the county employees and, and other different networks of emails. So all I would say is uh, we're open. We've still, there's, the community process isn't over. The next meeting is August 19th, and uh, this is still not a closed process. So we want your help. If you, we, you, we can enlist you to help us get the word out as well. Okay, my name is Brady Westwater. My question is, uh, how much of the infrastructure dollars is being scheduled toward the ramps? Both the percentage amount of the 50 million and how much in actual dollars do you figure of the infrastructure changing of the ramps? Actually, we really don't know the answer to that. We've just uh, begun exploring how to deal with the ramps. Um, and uh, there is uh, part of the environmental impact statement actually addresses the ramps. So that's we're, we're beginning that process right now. Hopefully tonight will actually help us inform how much everybody feels the uh, removal of the ramps is important to the project in this first phase. Just to add to that, I, our, our next um, community meeting, we'll have three design schemes. I'm sure we'll have um, a variety of solutions that keep ramps and don't keep ramps to see how it really affects the park. And I think some um, people have been very adamant that in order to make the park work, the connections are really, really important. We want to understand how important that is versus how much it costs. Hi. Uh, my name is Al Sabo, and uh, I live in this area. So uh, so far, I hear that this project is for a diverse community, but most of the things you've been mentioning is uh, on how we can attract people from all over the city to use this park. Now, being a diverse community, if we go three blocks east, there are a lot of people of color and ethnicity that sometimes are left out of uh, parks such as this. A prime example is Pershing Square, where if anybody's been down there recently, uh, the restrooms are closed to people of color, to people who look besheveled, uh, to the general public. Most of the general public, the excuse they get away with is, well, if you park in their parking lot, those are the only people that can use those facilities. They took out the water fountains. Uh, people actually drink out of the waterfall uh, that's in the park. Now, all type of safeguards have you put into this project to protect the average citizen, the people of color from two blocks from here that want to come over and use this park? Will they be denied access to water fountains, uh, public restrooms, the picnic area? I'm concerned because it happened in Pershing Square, and damn it, I don't want to see it happen here. Well, I think we all agree with you, and we're as, as concerned as you are about this process, and I'm going to let the helicopter pass. And I can say, on, on behalf of the team, we're really trying to create, we hope, at the end of this process, a new civic space that serves all Angelinos, that, that this is not a place that has some kind of apartheid barriers up that separate this place by classes. This is actually the space that serves as the opportunity to connect the different parts of LA together. What we're doing is we're starting down at Spring Street and Broadway, and what we want to do is reinforce those north-south connections. I mean, I'd love to see the people who walk on Broadway on the weekends walk a couple more blocks up, have a great place for their kids to play, have something to do that changes their, their uh, they're normally on Saturdays and Sundays. We'd like to create a place that different community groups would use on a regular basis to create their community festivals so that you'd be able to come and have the, the Latino festival or the, uh, the Mayan festival or the Yiddish festival, whatever it is, that that's an easy place down there or maybe somewhere here where that can happen. We want the amenities that are, exist here to attract a wide variety of people so that uh, people, everyone feels safe and secure. Right now we have a situation where we've heard over and over again that the homeless are here and they own this park, Court of Flags, and people only want to walk through. They don't want to stay and linger. I think it's fine for the homeless to be here, but it also has to be a safe enough place that people feel that they, whoever they are, that they want to be here too. So this should be a place where everyone can take part.
uh, many, many of the people that live two or three blocks from here are in a lower socioeconomic uh, structure. And that's and, why and, a free and, park would help? Well, obviously, but what I'm uh, more interested in is uh, your concession stands, et cetera, where, where, where there will be the type of concession stands that actually these people can afford to come to. And again, that's why we're here tonight. We're here to get your ideas about what should be here. And we're not at a place where we're saying this is what the park is going to be. We're at a place where we're saying, tell us what the park should be. So that's, you know, we're going to put that down. That's what should be here. So it should be a variety of price points so that all different kinds of people can. Uh, for example, we had Mama's Hot Tamales here tonight. And I think that's a great ex economic model for what this park could do. They're working with MacArthur Park. And they're providing job opportunities for people in that neighborhood, in MacArthur Park neighborhood, to uh, actually develop their own businesses. Uh, they have a, a community incubator kitchen. And then the people create the tamales and work there in the kitchen. Then they go off and create their own catering businesses. And they also have the first legal sidewalk vending um, system in the whole city where that somebody can legally sell inside the park and what that did was create job opportunities for the neighborhood, created cheap and good food and everybody gains. That's the kind of model we'd like to see as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marty Kaplan from the Norman Lear Center. Besides doing a live webcast, we also have a live discussion board for people who are watching online to talk to each other and to you. And so on uh, their behalf, uh, dozens of questions are coming in. I'm just going to start with two of them, uh, two quick ones, not from me, but from them. One is, what impact will the Geary buildings uh, in Parcel Q have on the design of the park? And another is, what role do you hope technology would play in the park? Two great questions. Um, as far as the Gary building goes, I think we really need all the neighbors around the park to be very, very active to draw people here. And so we're looking at the at Frank's project as far as whether it's entrances, how you get to it, how you move through it, and ways to make the connection between that park and this place complete. We're not looking at just that project. We're also looking at all the other places around the area. So it's one of the, the contextual neighbors here that's essential to make this place accessible. And as far as technology, I think we really want to capture um, the imagination um, of what technology provides today in outdoor events. And so um, having um, access here to technology, using technology to make performances, particularly things that might happen in the evening, how technology informs art, um, I think this can definitely be a venue that takes advantage of, um, you know. Mark, can you just briefly describe Block Q? On the question was, can we talk more, a little bit more about the Gary Project and describe it? And I think it's probably best to go to the website and you can find out more details about it. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Linda, and I'm a Central City East community resident. And um, after listening to your presentation, the first thing that struck me is that there's going to be a whole lot of job opportunities here. And um, I wonder, um, as you know, we're the largest homeless capital in the world. Do you think this project is going to help ease that problem here in Los Angeles? Will there be jobs that are homeless and poor, low-income people are going to be able to have an opportunity at? Um, there will be a whole series of jobs throughout this development, including, I think, during the construction phase of the park, as well as during the operations and maintenance part of the park. Um, there will be efforts made, there will be a formal agreement that, in fact, specifies um, uh, a program for reaching out to the communities uh, around this park and around downtown, including downtown, to train and hire residents for the jobs that are specifically being provided. Now, a lot of them will be union jobs, so arrangements will have to be made with those specific unions for apprenticeship programs as appropriate. Uh, the question is yes, 
and uh, before we get to, I would say bef by the time of the next public hearing, there should, should be more detail presented to the public on that. I will finally say that the idea very clearly is to have those in the works before all of the actual programming gets started so that when jobs actually do come available, people are, are trained for them. Thank you. Okay, we've got how many still still in line? I would like to, well, we're going to do five more minutes of questions. Let's go here right here. Yep, right to the mic. Okay, um, my name is Joe Thomas, and um, as I was looking at the variations of the park here, I saw the accessibilities that you had to the park. And one thing that I did not see on accessibility was, if there's going to be accessibility to a park, say, if something were to happen and you have to go to a medical, like hospital or medical places or something like that, because I didn't see it in a, you know, accessibility to the hospital or something like that, and I think that's very important when you have a major park such as this one that you would have an accessibility to... To major medical. Exactly. I think we should, if you're going to participate in the thing out there, put it down that that's what you're looking for and we'll make a note of it. But it's also the kind of thing that I hope our police and fire would be able to respond uh, because they are located very close by. But I know that the California Endowment, uh, which is looking at the health of Californians, has been talking about the idea of how do you get out to people and could you have clinics and parks. So it's not something that might be out of the question to explore. So, thank you. That is a really important point. Hi, my name is Mark Porter Sasada from KCRW Radio. Um, I have a, a, LA has created many great parks over the last hundred years. Pershing Square, MacArthur, were all great parks at one time. All of them went to seed, were neglected. What's your long-term strategy? I know that Bryant Park in New York has a private foundation that runs the park and has all that great programming. All that programming could be going on now here, but it's not. What's your, I didn't see anything in the budget for programming either. What, what's your long-term strategy? Uh, well, I'm, my role on the team is to advocate for just that kind of thing. And I'm hoping that we can find out a way to build in an endowment uh, for this. Do you want to, you, you're jump, Martha's jumping to answer no, this no, too. No, no. <laughs> Bill, Bill's, Bill's making sure he answered. Um, the, the truth is we haven't figured it all out yet, but um, we're in process with that just as we are with the design. But the intent is very clear, clear to have uh, probably a nonprofit entity of some type or description operate, manage, maintain the park, and do, do all the programming and everything. One model that I might point you to is, um, well this land, I think you all understand, is owned by the county. The music center is also owned by the county, but, but, the, but the music center has a lease with the county and they operate both the interior of the buildings, the buildings themselves and the exterior, the, the plaza, the open space. It may be one model for us. I'm not saying it's a music center, I'm saying it's just some sort of nonprofit entity. We're exploring a lot of options and uh, we're, we're very aware of it and our $50 million, it's tough to carve it up into endowment, construction, and everything else we need to carve it up into, but um, you know, it's, it's a good starting point, so that's where we're going. And well, yeah, ultimately Bill's pointing out, and he's right, we want the park to be able to pay for itself so that we have a variety of events, some that actually make money for the park and some that are just, you know, totally free to community groups to have festivals. But somehow we have to craft a budget to allow that to happen. Will related control the park after it's built? No. 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 So it's the county. Related's responsibility right now is to implement to, to assist in the design and construction, the implementation of the park. The county will always be the owner, and if the county chooses to, to engage with a nonprofit to operate it and maintain it, that nonprofit would have a board. Who's on that board? I don't, I don't know yet. Thank you for having this for us. I'm Kelly O'Brien, and I have seen several articles, and in the articles that referred that our fountain we've had for many years might be in the way of a bulldozer. When it was asked how many people here had seen the fountain, I didn't see a lot of hands. I have a very big interest in this fountain. It's called the Lang Fountain. It was built and designed when the music center and this whole mall was built. And my uncle, LaRue Lang, was the designer, the architect of this mall and the fountain. He was sent back to the boards to redesign it after spending midnight oil. So I want you to know some of this history. 
because they said it's not big enough for future development if we develop the wall. Then they had to put in bigger motors to run the fountain because it wasn't high enough. And if you do go up and you stand between the music center and lift down the mall, they put big motors in so that the water comes up when it's running, it frames our city hall. Now, our parents and grandparents and some of us paid taxes and built that fountain and it was built to be here forever. It's the beginning up there, it's to frame this whole mall, and somebody said, well, it might be in the way of a bulldozer, so we may just take it away. Anyway, those things are happening. That group has their cheerleaders. I think we ought to have our cheerleaders please go up and see it. It's so beautiful. It was extremely expensive at the time, but they went and made it bigger and more beautiful so that it could be here and be the start of this home mall from there. To take it out would just be like taking the Trivi Fountain out of Rome and taking the Eiffel Tower down in Paris. It is our fa uh, fountain, the Lang Fountain in Los Angeles. You have a lot of children that you say are going to come around here. Who doesn't want to push? Thank you. I think we get the point. We got the point. And actually, I'm going to ask the next people to just state your question. But I, I think that you want to respond? I just want to say I, I think that I mean, nobody here has any plan, any preordained decisions are made to do anything. That is actually the purpose of this is to act that if you read it in the Daily News, that was incorrect. What we are trying to do here is get an idea from the public, both via the web, via the surveys online and people here, what they would like. Uh, let's see, how many people want to keep the fountain right now? Raise your hand. Yay. Actually, not as many as you might have thought, but still, uh, your voice has been heard and please participate with it. I'm going to have to take Thank the next you. question. When you hear that, you know what it's all about. Now. Okay, I want to do this really quick because like, we, we really want to start the next thing. Yeah, so please one. state your question. I have more of a statement. The okay. center of the city is the plaza at Alvera Street. That's what all the mapping was done, the four leagues maps and everything. I keep seeing that you're trying to move it to either City Hall or Grand Avenue. It's not the case. It's always been diverse in LA, but it's been diverse from that point. And I think you need to design with that in mind. It's not going to change. I think we represent that, that LA is a multinodal city already with many centers. There's a historic center, there's no, a commercial you know, center, there's a retail center. Los there's Angeles is a Spanish city, unlike the rest of the country that was based well, on a British system. And the plaza is important to that. We're, yeah, we absolutely points. believe in the plaza. We're not trying to diminish the, the role of the plaza here. All we're saying here is here's another opportunity. The plaza should shine as, see, as I, much as it could shine. I didn't see it up there in your plans. I saw all the other ones, but the initial planning of the city of L.A. was the plaza. It is the starting point and ending point. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to end with Marty. So... Please be, be succinct so we can move forward. Thank you. I'll be uh, succinct. My name is Mark Williams. I'm from Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles. Uh, kids 15 minutes away don't have a safer place in the streets to play. Can we really afford to spend even $50 million on a park here for wealthy people? Uh, and what's, what's being described is more of a venue than a public park, if we're honest with ourselves. Can we do that? Is this going to be, is this the wisest use of fifty million dollars? Uh, and is it true that the county, uh, the person from the county that evaluated the land lease, said that it could have been restructured so that it would be four hundred? Oops, I'm sorry, so that it would be five hundred million dollars over ninety nine years, as opposed to fifty million. And that being the case, who's really going to pay for this? Okay, so we have two things on the table. Do you, anyone want to answer the 500 million versus 50 million? Is it net present value versus? You're saying that that's that that. Whether the 50 million dollars is how the 50 million dollars is used is a joint powers authority and county board of supervisors question, um, and no, that is not the the second statement is not correct that it was valued at 500 million dollars. I mean, I think that, that that is the policy issue that's already, like, as members of the design team, we've been given this charge. We, they've been said to us, how it's the best way to spend this money? If you want to make change on that level, I think you need to go back to the people who made the policy and said, 50 million is going to go to this park, which are the city and the county. Yeah, I think talk to your, talk I think to your elected authorities. Thanks. 
And Marty, I'm stuck. Oh, oh okay. Well, Marty and then this woman, then that's it. Uh, Quick. Some online questions. How will we deal with the loss of the big parking lot in front of City Hall? We're really? going to have parking right under this building which has been earthquake tagged, which is going to be retrofitted, which is enough parking to replace that parking. Will there be private donors for the park? Uh, we'd love it. Uh, come forward uh, if you, uh, and send in your cash, and you can speak to uh, right And And what guarantee, I didn't write this, what guarantee will there be that public input will be taken seriously? Uh, we're very serious. We're all Angelinos. We live here. We're going to live here for the rest of our lives, and we want to show our face in public and feel that we, we want to be proud of this park just as much as you. And we've, we've both been working, well, we've all been working downtown and in the Los Angeles region for over, collectively, probably 75 years, 25 years each, and so we have a long history of commitment to Los Angeles. And the last question. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Lois Arkin. And I'm uh, nearly a 50-year resident of Los Angeles and a uh, regular um, person downtown for the past 30 years or so. Uh, I have three issues. Uh, one is, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I did not, I was not here for the workshop, but I noticed... Well, the um, workshop's but, starting, so please put it in a question form so we can move it forward. I didn't see anything uh, on the on the list over there that addressed issues of sustainable development. Sustainable development. And so that's one question, mm -hmm. what is the commitment there? Number two, what is the commitment to sharing streets equally with pedestrians and bicyclists? Yes. Um, <clears throat> equally, um, so that means cars get mm -hmm. much less space, if at all. And mm -hmm. uh, my preference would be, do, are there any... And the third? Are there any plans to make? The, the Grand Street Promenade car free, as in, for example, the great streets of Barcelona. Um, <clears throat> number, and the third? Th number three, I heard uh, uh, someone just address issues of parking, and I'm wondering why we would even consider making one more parking space in downtown Los Angeles. Okay, uh, sustainability. Sustainability is essential to design this park. Um, you will see it. We're, we've been talking about it, we'll continue talking about it. Uh, second, sharing the streets? I mean, well, I, I think we really want to talk, we've talked a lot about connecting to the streets. Obviously, pedestrian movement and pedestrian flow is key to getting people to the park and having them understand that they're moving through a district that includes a park. So uh, we'll be looking at ways to do that. Uh, whether that includes bikes, I don't know, but it certainly will include pedestrians. And, uh, and right now, there is no. Um, we are not calling. We are not calling for any additional parking. We're just calling for replacing existing parking that's here already. And uh, because in the great city, because um, we're required to, because we yes, have to. But we're going to change that with new planning well, director. Well, you talk to your people and see if you can make a change okay. on that. But right now, we're required to. Thank you so much. So this is how it's going to work. There's still coffee, there's still cookies, and there's still tamales. There's ten tables out there, ten round tables. Go to a table, and we're going to start this process. And we need RCH staff and Lebanon Associate staff to, to get out the boards and to help set this up. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.